What up, what up, what up? Welcome into another edition of Green with Envy. We have all made it. The NBA season is back, and we're here to celebrate it with, of course, a gathering of the three man weave. This is your boy, Will. We are checking in. How you doing? How you living? First up, we got the coach of the podcast, my best friend, the one and only Greg Manakis. How you doing, buddy? Excited, bro. Excited. Season's here. Next up, you know who it is. It is the leader of the Taylor gang, our podcasting cousin from across the pond, the one and only Adam Taylor. Been a minute. What's good, Adam? Yeah, it's been too long, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was on the verge of Hades. I'm, I'm back now. Hey, listen, we 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 had some you some of our fans on YouTube were asking, yo, where's Adam T at? I mean, we've had we've had engagements, we've had COVID, we've had wisdom teeth out, we've had uh, you know, undiagnosed injuries from Coach Greg. We've had a whole lot going on, but <laughs> I gotta say this. I gotta say this. When it comes time, when the lights are brightest and the NBA season's back, the three man weave does not fuck around with load management. All three of us here today to talk about the opening of the NBA season. So I'm proud of you, my guys. I'm proud of you. We're not like the Phoenix Suns, who Bradley Beal's already sitting out game one, and Devin Booker might be out game one. So uh, <laughs> we're a little bit better than them. Yeah, not a not a hot start from from the new look Suns, but let's set this up for y'all today. We are super excited. Uh, so we're recording this on Tuesday, the official open of the NBA season. As Greg just alluded to, it's going to be um, the Lakers and Nuggets to tip it off, and then it'll be the Suns and Warriors. Sands, Bradley Beal, maybe Devin Booker, uh, take it on the Warriors after that. And then, of course, your Boston Celtics Wednesday night in Madison Square Garden against the New York Knicks. It all goes down, tip off a brand new season. Myself, Adam, second half of this podcast, we sat down with our homie from Knicks Film School, the one and only Jonathan Macri. Uh, we chopped it up with him. Got a whole preview set up for that to get you set up for what the Knicks look like coming into the season, what that matchup can look like. Uh, and we didn't have enough time. It was a quick interview, but we didn't have time to quite get into those Joel Embiid spicy rumors that are, that are hitting the internets today, but We'll uh, we'll have more on that. We tease it at the very end of the of the of the podcast today, so we'll come back to that. But we got the three man weave together. It's been a minute. NBA season starting. We're excited, so we're gonna do three things that we're excited about for the upcoming NBA season here in honor of the three man weave, and we're gonna snake it around here. So we're gonna we're gonna start with Adam. Then we'll go to Greg, then we'll go to me, and then we'll we'll snake it back till all three of us can get three things that we are really excited about for this NBA season. So with that being said, Adam, you are up first here. What is the first thing that you are excited about for the upcoming season? The firm excited for is the Jason Tatum low post work. If you I don't know if you guys read the John Corrales piece earlier today, uh with Sam Cassell talking about Tatum, the, the one thing he needs to add to his game and to really take him to that, like, quote-unquote, difficult to guard, which I took as unguardable level, was low post mastery, learning how to play make out of there, learning when to attack, when to go quick, when to go slow. I like the fact that Casal's challenging Tatum to add more to his game, even, you know, just a two-time All-NBA guy. I'm excited to see how that goes, excited to see how that elevates him from where he is now towards that MVP level. Absolutely. Yeah. And Sam Cassell for, you know, some people out there, maybe kind of new to new to newer to basketball, maybe a little bit younger than us here. Sam Cassell was a great mid post player as a point guard, right? That was one of the things that he excelled at. Um, shot that great little mid post fade away, great back to the basket game as a point guard. So when I mean, you see all these videos of Tatum working with Cassell, it's got to get you excited because Sam Cassell was crafty. He was crafty yeah. as all hell. And I think that's one thing with Tatum. He's so polished in everything that he does that it's like at times it can be like almost too polished. Like it's too pretty. It's too textbook. You want to get a little things. gritty with it? Want to yeah. like mix it up a little bit? Yeah, like a little um, a little deceptiveness in there, a little a little trickery in, in the post I think could really add a lot. So I, I agree. And that's something I mentioned on the, on the last podcast. Um, I think that the Celtics need for Tatum to reach that next level. Um, him going into the post and getting at least at least three real post opportunities, um, ideally per per half, but probably per game is more likely. I, quick, I think quick that question the before we level. before we go to your your first thing that you're excited for, Greg. I wonder how many because po- we, we've mentioned this with Tatum, 
we mentioned it with, with Holiday in one of the last preseason games about, you know, how we, we didn't go to Marcus Smart in the post probably enough when we had him. I think Holiday is going to be even better in that position. And then KP is is very widely known for being for performing very well out of the post as well. So it, it is leaving me a little bit curious as to, you know, obviously the Celtics aren't going to run all of their offense through the post, but we now have three different guys that we're all making cases for that that should get some post touches uh, throughout a game. So it is going to be an interesting thing to keep a, keep an eye on throughout the season. Yeah, and I'll, I'll I think that's a perfect transition to my first thing that I'm excited about. My first one, I'll keep it Celtics related, is year two of Missoula Ball. Um, I think just seeing you know all of the the interviews that you see with Joe Missoula, how much more comfortable he seems, how much more relaxed he seems just being in front of the media coming into the year with a whole summer to learn from his mistakes, the JJ Redick interview that we talked about and um, how much he really seemed to learn from everything that happened in year one, where it had to just be like not thrown into the deep end, but plunged into like the deepest, like the Mariana trench of the fucking ocean. You know what I mean? And Joe Missoula is just told, try and find your way to the surface. You don't even know which way is up right now. Year two, he's coming in and he's able to implement all of his systems. He's not just doing um, basketball as math, right? He's understanding that basketball is a game that needs to be played. You need to have all these counters and Missoula ball year two promises to have more post touches, more, um, you know, differentiating the action, having more uh, curve balls on the defensive end. We're seeing the zone defense on half court. We're seeing the two, two, one. So all the things that um, Missoula ball could become in year two, where year one Missoula ball almost was um, kind of looked at it in, in, as a pejorative. Am I the only one that doesn't know what the Mariana Trench is? <laughs> it's the deepest I part of the ocean. No clue. Okay. <laughs> is it not Das Equis? <laughs> <laughs> the Mariana Trench is the deepest part of the ocean. Okay. Okay. I, I, I you said that, and I, I genuinely lost track of. I lost track of everything else you were saying. Grace. I was just so going to say, like, I, I genuinely believe. <laughs> I genuinely believe it was food related. I honestly <laughs> thought the the like Mariana Mariana Trench sauce, of marinara like... sauce. Not exactly, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel silly. Uh, That's twice well, now. I've said so much stupid since we've been on air. Hey, it happens, man. It happens. Well, hey, we all learning something here. That's that's what part of this podcast is. Is we're learning and we're growing together. And uh, I agree with you, Greg, on all you said about Missoula, but the Mariana Trench just really stole the show in that entire uh, in that entire explanation that you gave. But with that, I'm gonna move on to my. I'm gonna move on to my number one thing here. And I'm going to keep it Celtics related for, for this first round that we're that we're doing here. And it kind of piggybacks on Adam's point a little bit here. It's a little bit of a prediction. I'm excited for the Jason Tatum MVP campaign because it is on. Because the more I think about it, Jason Tatum, to me, is one of four to five at most right now realistic candidates, I think, that could actually win MVP. He was fourth the season ago. He was six two years before that. Adam already mentioned back to back first team All NBA last year. He was thirty points per game, eight point eight rebounds, four and a half assists with his worst ever three point percentage. Both the last two years, he's been right at about thirty five percent. So, and and let me start here. Adam, Greg, and I have already planted our flags. Ten plus rebounds per game for Jason Tatum. Are you joining us on this? Man, that's a that's a tough ask. With everything else that he's going to be doing, and with Paul Zingas there just vacuuming up rebounds with his million foot wingspan, yeah, I'm going 10, 10. 10.2 rebounds again. Yeah, I, I think it's going down, man. I'm I'm big on the Jason Tatum rebound double double coming in. So I think this year, if he does hit that that ten rebound per game mark, here's my prediction for Jason Tatum stat line: thirty one point five points per game, ten rebounds per game. Five and a half assists. We're expecting him to to control the ball more, right? Like he's gonna be, he's gonna have the ball in his hands even more. Gonna be asked to play make. I think there's gonna be a lot more spacing out there. And so if you get that three point percentage from 35, just up back up to 36, 37 percent, that gets you a few more points per game. I think that's the that's the recipe, and maybe that all defense that he's talking about. I don't know. We'll see. I, I think that's going to be a bit of a stretch for him to get all the way to to all defense. But certainly, you know, he's he's no slouch on the defensive end. You put that all together. If you can get the number one seed, put yourself in a position ahead of Giannis, then I think you're really looking at, obviously Giannis is still going to be in that mix. Joker is going to be right there, but also 
is, is Joker really going to – Joker doesn't give a shit about stats, but that also is what makes him awesome, and then his stats are awesome even though he doesn't care. So, of course, he's going to be there. And then outside of that, kind of, you know, maybe Devin Booker, maybe Steph Curry. Jason Tatum's right there. So, uh, Jason Tatum, MVP campaign. That's what I'm excited about. So, we're now naming you Will Picante. We are. <laughs> a little spice for you? Yeah, yeah, a little bit spicy, a little bit spicy. I like it. I think the 10 rebounds is really difficult to accomplish with everything else that he's tasked with doing. To me, his defensive role is going to play a part in that. Like if he's asked to defend higher up on towards the perimeter, the re like he'll be getting more long rebounds. He won't be crashing back as much. But, you know, he's evolved as a rebounder over the last few years. He's one of the best rebounders on the team, if not probably a top two rebounder now, Paul Zingas is there. I don't see a reason why... If he wanted to, he couldn't average double digit rebounds. Yeah. And I think with, you know, the starting lineup that I'm hoping happens, you know, with Horford coming off the bench, I think there's going to be more opportunities for Tatum to get those rebounds with Porzingis being in drop and contesting shots. So if he's contesting shots as the drop defender, right, and not necessarily just firing back and getting position and boxing out, if he's there contesting, somebody has to get the rebound. You know what I mean? And Tatum, next biggest guy, is already a pretty good rebounder himself. He's at, you know, it was over eight rebounds last year. That's one of the things that I said um, coming into the season. The first couple weeks before the before Vegas catches on to Jason Tatum is going to average double double digit boards. I will be betting the Jason Tatum over on rebounds every single game because I think no matter what it is, you know, at the I think during the playoffs last year they they started setting it like seven and a half a game. And by the end of the playoffs, they were setting it like nine and a half a game. So they were starting to catch on to Tatum's rebounding in big games. We'll see if it happens over eighty two. Yeah, him playing in a lot of one big lineups or one traditional one big lineups is a big hedge for me as to why I think that, you know, Tatum's going to get to those 10 because he just has to. Like, I think he's going to have to if he's going to be the, you know, quote unquote power forward in these lineups. He's going to have to clean up that glass, especially when, when KP is there protecting it. Uh, and there's not going to be a lot of those double or as many double big lineups taking a lot of those boards away. So I think that's going to play a, a pretty big role. So I'm here for it. Jason Tatum. MVP, MVP campaign. We'll keep an eye on that. My number two thing I'm excited for, we'll go a little bit outside the Celtics here. And this isn't really a shock. This is just some low hanging fruit, but give me all the fucking Wemby you can. I am so excited for everything Wemby related. 19 points, three blocks per game in the preseason, but that that's like not even the story. It's him nutmegging guys in the middle of games. It's him blocking Clay Thompson at the three-point line, him swatting Steph Curry like he's playing basketball with Riley Curry. Like it just and it doesn't look natural. It just looks it looks like it's CGI. It looks like it's a, a made up 2K player. The way that he moves, the fluidity that he has within, you know, his game and, and his movements already pulling up from for deep from three catching off the elbow shots like I, I, we just haven't seen a dude like this. And, you know, it, it might be one of those rare LeBron James type cases where the hype is absurd but he may actually meet, live up to, or even exceed that hype. So uh, I'm all aboard for it. And, and Greg, you know, we got to keep a, a price alert, I think, on, on any Spurs games that we can maybe just hop in the car and go make, because I think any chance we can get a, get a glimpse of Wemby, we might just have to take it this season. If you weren't going to say the Wemby hype, I was going to say the Wemby hype. I figured. Because, it, like yeah. I said, it's, it's low hanging. For how one of how us tired are you guys on Wemby and Chet, though? Like, do you think well, there's a huge talent disparity between those two? Because I think they've the, like I don't think the talent gap is as like seismic as what everybody believes. I think they're they're quite similar. Like I'm I'm just as excited for Chet as I am for Wemby. Yeah, I mean I have written down here what I was gonna go piggy off piggyback off of that was Wemby versus Chet in that yeah. rookie of the year race this this season. I'm really excited for that. As much as I champion the player of the class belt, it is pretty cool that this year, the fact that we have the traditional rookie of the year, <laughs> even though Chet Holmgren is not a rookie, this is his second year in the NBA, the fact that they get to compete against each other for what I, I agree, Adam, I think it's going to be a, an historic uh, rookie of the year race because Chet is so damn good. He's just not 7'5", right? That's, right. The, that's that, the difference. That's me. My point is that, Chet, e even though we have rarely seen some of the things Chet's done from a guy that size, like you can kind of look at Porzingis and say, oh, I've seen some of these things. Like Wemby just visually is a whole mm -hmm. other ball game, well, even Chet's compared to 7-2 Chet. 
Like, you know what yeah, I mean? Like, it's seven crazy. Feet. He's not seven, seven feet either. That's yeah, what's whatever. wild, right? We're talking about a seven foot guy and being like, yeah, but come, he just doesn't have the size that when he does, you know what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, but I know absurd it is. But Chet, I mean, the, the Chet block that he had on Dame Lillard, like how often do you see Dame Lillard's step back jump shot get blocked? Um, a lot this season when he's coming up against the Celtics. Let's hope. <laughs> Let's hope. But That's... but also just in this Chet Wemby, like guys they've blocked in the preseason. Just think about that. We've mentioned Dame Lillard, Clay Thompson, and Steph Curry. Like these are the type of guys that are getting their shots blocked by these uh, gigantos like i don't even know the right word to call these guys <laughs> gargantuans is the only word that there you go that's a good one that's a good one dust ekis dust ekis is that what that is that what that means um, <laughs> i mean no, there's, no I, need, and there's no need there's no need dust equis what's it what is it dust equis by, by the way it's just for, for those of you listening um we were talking with adam but before we we came, we came on today uh about a potential probo opportunity that involved dos equis beer uh <laughs> which adam called dos equis dos equis dos equis we don't have it here dude and like my spanish is now the is sponsor of a of this th of three things from the three man weave sponsored by dos equis <laughs> i mean um, <laughs> so i i had my second thing it's Wemby versus chet i'm really excited for that adam what's your second thing you're excited about i went celtics related again i'm excited for friday baby celtics versus miami eastern conference finals rematch miami got worse this summer and i've seen some takes that they improved by like you know addition by subtraction i think that's a lot of shit i think you lose gay vincent that was a huge part of your finals run you you lose max Struess, which was kind of like always a painful sight for celtics fans you know what i mean uh, i don't think they've improved i think that boston have really taken a leap ahead of miami now and they're going to be out for revenge man and i'm just really really excited as long as they win if they lose i want to be furious because the social the timeline is going to be unbearable but i got a question for you guys on miami because it's it, once again miami is so fucking frustrating to talk about because i don't want to feel like i'm slighting them or overlooking them because i just can't do it anymore i can't do it they they're they're too tough. They but they really are one Jimmy Butler shot away from beating us three times and three chances in the conference finals. But when you look at that team, and I'm with you, Adam. The the Gabe Vincent loss, the Max Struess loss is is I think big. I think a little underrated is their Josh Richardson addition. I like him back. Yeah, uh, Jamie, team, I don't, what, is it Jamie Vasquez? Oh, love love my guy Jamie. He's uh, gonna be Jamie, some, Jamie Jaime. Jaime. Love him or Jaime yeah. Jaime Jaime yeah. Hawkes. Jaime Hawkes. Go. I'm sorry. Love that dude. I loved him at UCLA. I, I knew the Celtics were especially when they had the 24th pick. I was like, maybe there's a chance he the Celtics can can get him, but it was a little bit out of their reach. But my question for you guys is regular season. We know in the postseason doesn't really matter what seed the Heat come in as you got to respect them. But where do you think they finish in the regular season? I've got them as a playing tournament team, dude. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on um, health. One thing with Jimmy Butler, how willing is he to to get up to close to 70 games? You know, Jimmy Buckets is their best player. Um, Bam, you know, can Bam continue to take the leap on the offensive end? We've seen more and more um, Bam Adebayo stepping into a larger role on the offensive end. Obviously, I've, I've been saying for years, Bam Adebayo should be a defensive player of the year. If he wins defensive player of the year, it's because the Miami Heat had a very successful season, right? So if you're penciling in Bam for defensive player of the year, he's anchoring a defense that does still have some good pieces there, right? That's one thing. Although Tyler Hero gets knocked for not being a good like isolation defender, he's a good rebounder at least. He, yeah. he can he can board up. Um, Josh Richardson is a very underrated defender. He can still play some good defense. We saw that on the Celtics. Like he had some great blocks. He he was a good point of attack defender, uh, chasing people over screens. Um, you know, Martin had a heck of a playoffs. Can he continue to do that? Will they bring him off the bench? Is he going to start? Uh, Hakez, as, as you guys mentioned, has a lot that he can bring to the table. And then they got Spo. You know, Spo's never one to – he sees the the bigger picture. You always see the Heat kind of not playing great in the regular season and then turning it on towards the end. The Heat were the team that – you know, I forget how many years back now, probably like four or five years back, they had the like 11 and 30, 33 start and then their record flipped the second half of the year and it was like mirror images of the yeah. same team. Like they they just do that. Spo understands that they're trying to get ready for the playoffs and that he's going to have his team ready for the playoffs. So I think, I think definitely if 
early in the season, it looks like, you know, damn, the East is a little bit deeper than we thought. We might need to turn it on sooner than normal because if we might get left out of the plan, then I could see the heat like ending up six seed, fifth seed. But I agree with Adam. I think they're going to be in the plan again. Yeah. Six to eight seed feels about right. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Everyone should be terrified of them come playoff time. Like Greg said, just just laid out the whole case for it. So but I was just curious to get your guys thoughts on that. Adam, let's uh, let's take us around. Uh, let's, let's take us around the world here one more time. You got your third thing that you're excited about. So this one is a non Celtics related thing, and it's literally just a hope more than something I'm excited about. So I'm hopeful that we finally get to see a full healthy season from Zion. Like I um, think that's on my list. I think everybody's talking about the Wemby, the Chet. You know, I feel like we've disrespected disrespected Scoot Henderson a little here. We know one's mentioned Scoot. I'm excited for Scoot too. But Zion, when everyone's like Wemby is the biggest name to come into the league since LeBron, well, Zion was that before Wemby, right? And we've just never really got to see it. We had that one healthy season under Van Gundy where there was like point forward Zion and everyone was intrigued about, hey, if he can become a playmaker and he can drive and dish and his second jump a bit, but he, he just hasn't been able to put it together. All the reporting coming out of New Orleans is like, he's really healthy. He's been in the gym a bunch. He's shed some weight. Like this is the most, the most professional version of Zion anybody's seen. Obviously he had that entire whatever you want to call it to start the off season. And maybe that's helped refocus him. But I'm, I, I, if, he, if, he's locked in, if he's locked in and he's healthy, like I'm really excited to see a locked in, healthy, motivated Zion. And I really want to see him go up against Wembley. I think that'd be so <laughs> much fun because it's just the um, like straight six, power. Six seven, five. Oh. Yeah. But String one guy can bench. Versus, versus the black Panther. Like see, see what the incredible happened. Hulk versus Mr. Stretch. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, Yeah, I think with Zion, the biggest thing with him is how much have those injuries sapped him of the otherworldly explosiveness, right? He could be have a healthy year, but if he if his vertical isn't what it was, you know what I mean? Like that's what made him really special, especially with his ability to finish around the rim. Is he's I mean, the guy is six five, six six, right? So if he doesn't get above the defense in the post like he was before. You know, he he might struggle to finish like he was shooting 70 percent near the rim early on in his career. If that comes down to 60 percent near the rim, you know, the the MVP level nature of Zion might be past him, you know. But if, if he can still get up and for example, that breakaway dunk that we saw in the in the preseason where he had the steal and he had a wide open breakaway dunk. I don't know if you saw how high his head was towards the rim. It was not anywhere close to what it used to be, you know, so. I'm just wondering how much of that explosiveness is still left within him. Obviously, he's still going to be a crazy effective player. But, you know, with Zion, to Adam's point, you know, Wemby, all the hype around Wemby, when Zion came in the league, everyone was like, watch out. Like, we, we better right. win now because if this dude, he could just take over the league. He's a freaking monster. And, and I thought about his name as I was making the, the Wemby, LeBron hype. Uh, comparison earlier I was like well Zion's in this category but as far as the living up to and exceeding it just health hasn't allowed him to do it consistently when he's out there he very much has and then Greg I always think about that point that you just made here is that since he's coming to the league these injuries have we've already seen it take a toll on his athleticism because I think when he first came into the league everyone's just thinking oh my god this is gonna be you know the the first four to five years of Blake Griffin 2.0 with a guy that has you know an incredible skill set and reason to dunk on everybody I can't really think of too many highlight dunks in in Zion Williamson's NBA career that that really jumped to mind right so it's all been more below the rim him using that strength in you know, some combination of of Shaq strength and Charles Barkley's body. That's been mm-hmm. really fascinating to watch in the ways that he gets his shots, but it hasn't been that same explosion of athleticism like we thought. Right. Is he, is he going to just like end up being like a mix of Rodney Rogers and Julius Randall you know, or Zach, <laughs> like, it, like how much Zach Randolph is going to be in his game, yeah. you know, like the evolution really... of Zion is, is, is to the point of, you know, what to watch for this upcoming season. It, it's fascinating to see, what it would look like if he actually plays 60 to 70 games and you know what what form it, it takes now and what the what the longevity is behind it potentially all right greg let's uh let's go to your second your your, your last thing excuse me that you're excited for okay i'm gonna say two things one of them i'm just gonna say it and then the other one one, I'm one more thing it. king never <laughs> dies no matter what 
I'm excited for Cade Cunningham's return. Okay. I'm just going to say that we, I love Cade. I'm excited for what he's going to do, but the, for this purpose of this discussion, I'm excited to see what this, the ex Celtics are doing around the league. You know, you just saw Aaron Neesmith got his extension. What does Neesmith become? Ime in Houston. We're going to be able to go see some of those games. Well, I'm sure um, just checking in to see how he may bring, you know, as much as I want Joe to succeed, there's a part of me that's always going to wonder what if he may had stayed with, with Boston, right. To see how the Houston Rockets develop under him, Grant Williams, like, please, please. I want Grant Williams to have a fun, exciting career, but that Mavericks team is a fucking mess. So I don't know that he's going to have a great year and I want him to have a great year. Rob, you know, Rob being in Portland, does he end up on a, on another team? Please, Lord, I'm asking you if I'm praying to a Lord, I'm praying to the time Lord, right? Don't end up on an Eastern conference team that the Celtics have to play in the playoffs. Like if Rob Williams ends up making a difference against the Celtics in the playoffs this year, I will absolutely cry. I will just sit there and sob. The Miami heat trade for Rob Williams, Rob Williams becomes the swing factor in the Eastern conference semifinals. I Adam, I, I want to kill brought you that right up. now. I, I wanna, literally brought I wanna, that up last podcast. I want to. I want to kill both of you for even putting that out there. I mean, that's mean. You don't want to kill us, can you? I'm gonna you no, know, I do. Know. I literally do. I want you both to die. Like, like how I about just wanna... a paper cut? Would you do a paper cut? Like that's no. Crazy. I mean, I, God damn, think, dude. I can't. I cannot. I would not be able to handle Robert Williams on the Heat. I would not be able to handle it. I would run away. I'm hurt. <laughs> truly, truly hurt. Well, for, for the sake of, of my life and Adam's life, let's hope that Rob Williams does not come in and uh, disrupt the Boston Celtics uh, in their Eastern Conference playoff run or in any in any form, in NBA Finals, whatever it may be. Let's hope that for the sake of this show, because Greg might be doing a solo pod by the end of the year. If, well, you'll, uh, you'll if, both be dead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. You could I mean, that's an expensive murder, though, right? To fly over here. <laughs> To kill me, then to figure out how the fuck to get back out the country in time. Like you're gonna have to spend some money and do some real planning, man. I, I feel okay with this. I'm not too concerned. <laughs> I mean, my, him killing me is pretty easy. He knows where I live. He knows he knows the ins and outs. I mean, Adam, you just you just told us you get you get some of these boxes of wine sent to you and all this stuff. You know, maybe I just like fake a package with some tainted wine. Who knows? <laughs> Oh, that's a woman's poison. You don't have my address. I'm okay. I'm okay. If you ever ask for my address now, the answer is no. <laughs> All right, let's uh let's wrap this up here. I got one last thing that I'm excited for, and I'm gonna keep it with the Celtics here to round us out here. And there's a little bit of another. I'm I'm sticking on the the predictions. We didn't do the full uh awards, but I'm gonna keep it with the awards here, and I'm gonna go with Derek White and Drew Holiday make the all defensive team. Very rare that you see two members from the same backcourt, two members of the same team. It has happened. Two members of the same backcourt. And I, don't, I can't say starting because I don't know if it's going to be, if they're technically going to be starters or, you know, if Derek White's coming off the bench or someone's coming off the bench, might make it a little bit more difficult. But trivia question for you guys did some research today. Dating back to 1980, I could only find one set of backcourt specific teammates that both made an all defensive team. One made the first team. One made the second team. Can you guys name that backcourt? Can you give us like a like an? Era? I'll give you the. I'll give you the year. I'll, I'll, I'll give. I'll give you the year. Well, I wanted to see if, if you if it somehow just came to you right away. Then I was going to give you a, a few more clues here, but I'll give you the year: 2012, 2013. Ooh. 2012, 2013. There is a Boston connection to it. There's a Boston connection to. It. I'm fighting the urge to just type this in. You know that, right? <laughs> hey, it, it's it's kind of difficult to just type. Uh, believe me, I, I had to do a lot of manual research for this, so I was like, I got to use this on the show. This took me way too long to actually look up. And if I, I and mean, by the way, if this is not 100 percent correct, and someone listens to this and finds it to be inaccurate, let me know. But I'm I'm almost positive. This is <laughs> I got only I, that court. I got nothing. There was a Boston Celtic this off season that was also traded to this team. <laughs> I love that you're continuing to give hints. Um, <laughs> Tony Allen. Tony Allen, yeah. And Allen. Mike Conley. There it is. I did Tony cheat. Allen. Yeah, it's all good. Tony Allen first team, Mike Conley second team. That's the only time, and I only, I only went back to 1980, that I've ever seen that there were two members of the same backcourt that made the all-defensive team. I think Derek White and Drew Holiday can do it this year. If they're both starting, I really like their chances to both do it. If one of them's coming off the bench, I think it's going to make it 
a little bit tougher, but that's something that I'm going to be watching for is if we can get two guards in the all defensive spots. Okay. Well, I'm glad that at the end of the exercise, you, uh, you did the exercise correctly rather than making a prediction. You would say, uh, I'm excited to see if these two guys make the all. <laughs> the hey man, I got, I got to sneak it in here. We wanted to do a little bit different, but I like some of those prediction podcasts. So we got to, I got to sneak it in where we can here. And on that note, before we leave, I'm going to make you guys do it here. Give me your NBA finals prediction. Greg, Adam, I'll round us out, and then we'll send it over to a preview of the Celtics-Knicks opening night. Celtics, Lakers, Celtics win. Adam? I've got hmm, Celtics, Suns, Celtics win. Celtics, Warriors, Celtics get revenge. That's going to do it for this side of the Green with MB podcast. Give it, take a quick break here, and then on the other side, you're going to hear myself, you're going to hear Adam, you're going to hear Jonathan Macri. It's open at night, Celtics-Knicks. Sit back and enjoy.